Matthew chapter number 26. I'm going to begin reading in verse 36. You may just remain seated. I'll read this for you this morning. If you have your Bible, you can follow along with me. If you don't have your Bible, there should be a pew Bible there somewhere in close proximity to where you are. You may use that if you so choose. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Now, the word Gethsemane, we know uh, the Bible tells us that this was a garden. Uh, we know that it was uh, behind, it was just outside of the city limits of Jerusalem, behind the temple. Um, and uh, they're uh, right at the edge of the Mount of Olives. And uh, this garden is uh, still there today. Um, and uh, uh, this was a, a place that Jesus had gone to a number of times. Uh, it was not something that was unusual uh, for him to go there. It was not something that was unusual for his disciples. In fact, uh, some uh, historical accounts tell us that there was a place there in the garden where oftentimes the disciples would go and they would find rest there. They would sleep there. Uh, and so this was not anything that was unusual. But here they are. They're on their way now to Gethsemane. Uh, and Jesus said, verse 36 still, saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell upon, fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He came unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. We started quite a few Sundays ago on a journey. We started on a journey from the cradle to the cross. And this is our final Sunday in our journey Tomorrow evening at 6.30, we will gather together for communion. And we will end this year and we'll begin in, we bring in the new year by the act of remembrance of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper that we have been commanded to observe. And so today it's fitting that we come to this spot where we now uh, are exiting the upper room and we are heading now out for Christ to be able to do the work that he did for us. Last week we peered into the upper room and we saw our Lord wash the feet of the apostles. And then once Satan had entered into Judas, he left the upper room. And John spends quite a bit of time in his gospel recording for us the teaching that Jesus did with the rest of the apostles who were left there. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is now about to become the sacrificial lamb. And he spent those last few hours teaching his apostle. This morning we're going to continue our journey as Jesus is about to leave the upper room and head out to Gethsemane. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we now begin to conclude this journey that we've been on, Father, you have shown us a great deal. You have opened up to our understanding, and especially mine, much more than I had ever seen in the past. And still, Lord, as we have studied throughout the morning this morning, and will again this afternoon, there's a great deal that you have been opening, and I am assured that you will continue to open and much understanding that you've given to us. And Lord, we've taken this journey gladly. 
Uh, Father, as the rest of the world has celebrated Christmas as being a time of Santa, Father, we have chosen that we want to take all of our time to focus on the Christ child, to focus on the work that you did for us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, today as we conclude our journey, I pray that you would, again, through your spirit and your word, teach us and help us to see what it is you want for us to glean from this account. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Amen. The Bible records for us that they had sung a hymn together before leaving the upper room that evening. Oftentimes when we partake of the Lord's Supper together, uh, as we end, I'll say they sung a hymn, and uh, so we'll sing a hymn, and we'll sing a hymn, and they pray, and off we go on our way. But what they sang that night was not what we're used to. The, the, the hymns that we sing today were nothing like what Jesus and the apostles would have sung. Um, there, there was no rhythm to it like we have. There was no melody to it like what we have. In fact, it was more of a chant. And as I began to study and I began to look at this, and especially that hymn that they had sung, thinking that it wasn't what we sing today. And I wondered to myself, what was it that they did? What was, what was the hymn? And of course, to my mind, of course, automatically I thought of the Psalms. And the Psalms were much used by the Jewish people as songs. And they would recite them. And they would chant them. The New Testament, we have that account of the Last Supper. And Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn. And then they left for the Mount of Olives. Now it is said that, and I will probably pronounce this incorrectly, so Stephen, uh, forgive me if I do, but uh, halal is a chant that the Jewish people will chant at certain festivals. And one of those festivals, as they came to the end of it, they would chant the halal, uh, and uh, that was at the end of the Passover, which is where we come to Uh, as we see. And this was part of their ceremony. This was part of their celebration. And what the halal is, is it's Psalms 116 through 118. Now, we're not going to go and read those. We'll be reading those together tomorrow evening. And we will do, I believe, as what Jesus did that night. But you go home this afternoon and you read Psalms 116 through 118 and see if it doesn't open up the meaning and really bless you when you read that. And as part of that time, they would sing or they would chant the halal. And Jesus at that point in time, that was something that was very common during the century in which Jesus walked this earth. And so we already know that Jesus as a young boy spent his time in the tabernacle. We already know that he spent his time reading the scriptures. His family kept him uh, in the tabernacle. So Jesus would have been very well aware of that. And he would have followed the Jewish customs that they would have had. And so not only were they there that night, and they were partaking of the Passover, and Jesus instituted there for them the Last Supper, what we call communion. Jesus instituted that, but he followed through on the festival. And Jesus there and his disciples, they chanted that Psalm 116 through 118, all of them referring to himself as the Lamb of God. And then as they would customarily do, the Jewish people would spend their time in prayer after they had chanted the halal together. And so Jesus then leaves that upper room now, and he goes to that special place of prayer where he had gone many a times before. And he had gone and went to the Mount of Olives by which to pray. His apostles that were left, of course, Judas was not with him, but the other 11 were there with him, and they came along With him, And as he came to the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to eight of them, you sit here and you stay here. He never told them to pray. He never told them to watch. He just said to them, you stay here. As Jesus had walked that path with the eleven, he he still continued teaching them. If you look at John's gospel, John records that for us. And he continued to teach them. There was a lot of stuff he wanted them to know. There was a lot of stuff, much like Moses in Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy is not the second giving of the law. Deutero meaning second. 
Uh, uh, and they, they, a lot of people say, well, it was the second giving of the law. It was not the second giving of the law. What it was was Moses, the man of God, as he knew he would not be allowed to enter into the promised land. What was he doing? He was reminding the Israelites, wasn't he? He was going through and he was reminding them. Now, remember, this is what we promised. Remember, this was the law that was given. Remember, this is what you're supposed to be doing. When you come into the land, he wasn't going to be there. He wasn't going to be there to be able to help them. He knew that his life was about to end. He knew that it was all uh, just about finished for him. And so he was encouraging the Israelites and he was telling them, when you come into the land, make sure you remember all these things that we promised God that we would do. And now Jesus, as he's about to leave this earth, he's taking those now just 11 apostles and he's teaching them and he's reminding them and he's telling them these are the things you've got to be, uh, be aware of. And don't forget, I'm going to come back. He said, I, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am there, ye may be also. And he encouraged them and he taught them. And now they reach Gethsemane and he tells a handful of them, eight of them, to sit there in the garden he said, I'm going to go yonder and pray. That was not unusual for them. For that's where Jesus would go to the mount. And so I believe Jesus, from that point, the Bible says he went on a bit of a space. And I believe that Jesus went on then up the Mount of Olives, where he normally would go and spend his time in prayer. He took with him three of his closest, Peter, James, and John. The three who he had sent to prepare the Passover. He knew he could trust them. He knew they would do what he asked them to do. And so in that upper room, it was these three men to whom had prepared the Passover that they had just finished partaking of together. The same three to whom Jesus brought with him to the mount as he was transfigured there. By the way, what was it that Simon Peter did there that day as well? He slept. Did he not? As Jesus Christ was transfigured before them, and Moses and Elias spoke with Jesus, encouraging him about the death he was about to die. We are told that Jesus took these three men, and as he went the bit of a distance, from the other eight, he told them, you stay here and you watch. And then Jesus went on a little farther to pray. The idea that we have in our head in Christ's command to watch was to keep an eye out. We kind of figured they were supposed to be looking around and making sure everything was okay. But Jesus didn't need them to do that. It was not at all what he needed them to do. What he needed them to do was to watch in prayer. He didn't specifically tell them that as he went on a little bit of a distance. He didn't need them to keep their eye out. What he needed them to do was to pray with him. Jesus said to these three men, he said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. To watch literally means to stay awake. Jesus was in singleness of heart as he earnestly prayed to the Father. And his expectation for these three that he took along with him, those who are closest to him in his earthly ministry, was that they would stay a little distance from him and they would pray with him. He didn't ask them to keep their eye open. But he also did not want them to sit there and twiddle their thumbs. He needed them to enter into their prayer closet with him before the throne of the Father. Now he, in his humility, God himself, in human form, needed those three closest friends to stick with him and pray along with him to the Father. Not much earlier, he had told Simon Peter, he said, Simon Peter, Satan wants you. Not only did they need to watch and pray that evening because the Lord needed them, 
But they also needed to watch and pray that evening because soon the devil was about to get a hold of them. They needed to watch and pray. He needed them to watch and pray. But Jesus, think about this for just a moment. The God of all creation is now the loneliest man on earth. Just three, he asked, could you just watch with me? Peter, could you not watch with me just one hour? And he now is by himself. Those three men are going to run from him. Peter is going to deny him. And Jesus knew this. And now the God of all creation, the sacrificial lamb, the loneliest man on earth. Notice again what happened. You have Matthew chapter number 26. Look at verse number 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it be possible that this cup, cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew is only giving us a snippet of Christ's prayer. John records much of Christ's prayer. But Peter, again, had to be rebuked by Jesus. He had to be rebuked quite a bit, didn't he? Why? Because they did not stay awake, as he had asked them to do. I, I read this, and to myself, I think to myself, why is Peter being singled out? Right? There were two other guys there, right? Jesus is coming back, and he sees all of them sleeping. It wasn't just Peter who was sleeping. Peter is the one in whom we uh, look down upon because he denied the Christ, right? And yet all of the others denied him as well. Thomas we call Doubting Thomas. Thomas walked away and, and gave up all faith and all hope completely. And yet Peter is the one that we look down on. I thought, why, Peter? Lord, why did you come back? to Peter, and you spoke specifically to him. And the thought came to my mind, because of whom much is given, much is required. Peter had been given a lot. Tell me one other human being other than Jesus Christ on this earth who's walked on water. Peter. Peter walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He was places that nobody else got to go. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed very briefly his glory to Simon Peter. Nobody else. Simon Peter had the slight opportunity of getting to see that. He, he, he peeled back that robe of flesh just briefly, and Peter got Peter had been through a lot. And as a result of that, I believe Christ required more of him. Because the more God reveals to you and me, of himself, the more he requires of us. My prayer is almost on a daily basis, Lord, reveal yourself more open. I want to know more of you. And every single day, God, through his word, in the study and the reading of the word of God, God opens himself to me. Even more. I get to learn more about him. I get to know more about him, as did Simon Peter. But folks, the more we know, the more is required of us. And God required more of Simon Peter. Jesus took Simon Peter along with him, and he expected him to watch. Peter had heard the voice from heaven when he slept the first time. As Jesus was transfigured, he said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Listen, Peter. Pay attention, Simon Peter. And yet Simon Peter still, that night, the Mount of Olives, fell asleep. The devil will never stop laying temptations at our feet, folks. He is continually wanting us to stumble and to fall. And Jesus said to Simon Peter just prior to this time, he said, Simon Peter, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. But I've prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. You see, Jesus knew that Peter was about to deny him. Why? Because the devil was about to tempt him. I always think of the uh, two betrayals of Judas. 
The Bible tells us that as Simon Peter followed Jesus to the hall where he was falsely accused, there was another disciple who went along. The Bible doesn't tell us the name. The only thing the Bible tells us the name of the other uh, disciple that went along was he was someone to whom the high priests knew who he was. So who else would have been going along with them that evening, unafraid, to whom the priests knew who he was? It was the same disciple that walked out of the hall, seeing Peter stand there, and said to the damsel, this guy was with him. Judas not only betrayed Christ, he betrayed Peter. Judas, in my opinion, is the one who caused Peter to say, it wasn't me. You imagine being taken by surprise as the accusation was made? Jesus knew that, and therefore he said, Simon Peter, I, you, you need to watch and pray. We are here. Jesus Christ is about to go and do the work. And by the way, every single time before the Lord Jesus Christ ever did any great work or any of his apostles, they spent time in prayer, did they not? They spent time in watching and in prayer and singleness of heart before they would do that. And now they're about to do another great work. And Jesus said, you got to watch, guys. You three, especially, much has been given to you, much is required of you. You need to spend that time watching and praying because the devil wants you. He wants to sift you. He wants to destroy you. He's going to lay those temptations down at your feet. He's going to try and cause you to stumble. He's going to try and cause you to fall. And dear Christian, he's doing the same thing to you today. If you have any heart's desire at all whatsoever to truly know God and to truly serve God, the devil is working overtime on you. Maybe not he personally, but through his works of darkness, he's working on you overtime, what, to cause you to stumble. Right? The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The devil can't make you do anything. You ever people say all the time, the devil made me do it? No, he didn't. The devil can't make you do anything. If you're a child of God, the devil has no power over you at all whatsoever. But what he knows he can do is he can get you to submit yourself to him. We've talked about this all before. And if he can get you to submit yourself to him, then you're not submitting yourself to God, right? And what can he do? He can cause you to stumble. He can cause you to fall. So what does he do is he puts barriers, he puts roadblocks in your path, right? You say, well, what, what, well they're always one of three things, right? What are they? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he always uses those three things. He tried to use them on the Christ. And he has used them throughout the century. He used them on the Eve, the Garden of Eden. All three of them. He used every single one of them. He used it on Simon Peter. Because his desire was to sift him as wheat. He wanted to destroy him. He wanted to destroy his ministry. He wanted to destroy any work. Why? Because Simon Peter was one and his testimony was great. Because he had walked with Jesus. He had talked with Jesus. And Jesus had taught him. And Jesus had him to go out and to do the work. And so Simon Peter was one to whom the devil said, much has been given. Much is required. I want to destroy him. He wants to serve Christ. Christ, I am willing to die with you. The devil said, I want to destroy you. He did everything that he could, and Jesus said, watch with me. Simon Peter, yes, your spirit is willing. Your, your spirit is willing to die with me, but your flesh is weak. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Jesus said to them, watch, don't fall asleep. Peter's spirit was willing, his flesh was weak, and so Jesus wanted him to pray. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Paul wrote to the church concerning this need in the believer's life still today. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 1. Stay with me. We're going to read all the way down through verse number 11. I'll stop briefly at a few spots, make a few comments. This is applicable to us as our Lord 
said to those three young, those three young men that night, watch with me. First Thessalonians 5 1, the apostle Paul writes, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So he said, as a thief in the night, so as well is going to come that day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. I thought about that and I thought, isn't that appropriate? Because the thief who came that night was Judas. Right? He was a thief in the night. And the disciples had no idea. So our Lord will one day return. There's so many of us, we're trying to nail down that date, right? We're trying to pinpoint it, and we read prophecy, and we're trying to get it all down, and we're trying to figure out exactly, and it's almost as like we're going to win some sort of prize when we get to heaven, and God's going to say, ha, 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 good for you, you got it. You get the extra cookie. But Paul said distinctly that we have no need of knowing. Do you see that? Do you see that? He said there's no need to know these things. Why? It's not important to our salvation, nor to the work that we've been called to do. We must watch and pray so that we don't stumble and fall. We must stay awake spiritually, and we must pray without ceasing. Verse number 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I, I, I thought about that, and you, you realize that's one thing science cannot do. I never thought about it until I, I read this. You know, that's one thing science cannot do. They cannot pinpoint the time of the child's birth. You ever notice that? that even in a C-section, they cannot pinpoint when that child's actually going to be born in the world. They have no way of doing it. It's not possible. With all the stuff they have and all the science they've come up with and all the medicine that they've learned, they still can't pinpoint it. They, they can guess. They can kind of get somewhat close, but they cannot pinpoint the hour, the minute, and the second when that's going to take place. And Jesus said, that's how I'm going to come back. Oh, you can make all the guesses you want to guess. You can try all you want to try, but he said no one will ever will ever be able to pinpoint that moment. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, as He was on the Mount of Olives that night, was aware that His time was come. He told Peter, James, and John that His death was imminent. Therefore, there was a need to watch and pray. Now we, as children of God, know the return of our Lord is imminent. Therefore, we must stay awake and we must pray. Verse 5, Paul writes, Ye are the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. He's not talking about physical sleep. For if we do not ever get any sleep, we are physically going to die. He's speaking spiritually. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They sleep in darkness. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. They do these things in darkness. They have no light, but the children of God have light. And thus we must stay awake. Spiritually, we must stay sober. Spiritually. We are told throughout the epistles, be aware. Watch. Pay attention. Be sober. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. By the way, who wrote that? Peter. Verse 8, but let us, how are we going to stay awake spiritually? He said, verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the what? A faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. 
For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. We learned last week that we were to do to each other as Christ exampled for us in washing the disciples' feet. The act of humility that the Lord Jesus Christ did that night and the symbolism of the washing of the filth, the washing of the dirt, as the precious blood of Jesus Christ was about to be shed to wash away the sin. And Jesus said to Simon Peter that night, remember what he said? Simon Peter said, you're not washing my feet. I, could you, I, I can imagine what Simon Peter must have been thinking. My feet stink. You're not washing my feet. Oh, you honestly think, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Uh Uh-uh. And Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash thee, you don't have any part with me. You see, if you're not washed in the precious blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, you have no part of him. It's the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, the sacrificial Lamb of God, that washes away the sin of the world. And Jesus said, that act of forgiveness, that act of humility that I've done for you, he said, now you go out and you do that to others. Not that we have to come in and and wash each other's feet, but we must serve one another. The act of service is an act of humility. And for us to serve, there also must be an act of forgiveness. We must be willing to forgive whatever the trespass may be. Whatever someone has done to us, are you willing to place yourself in that place of servitude, Jesus said, and wash their feet? Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to take that humble position? The two characteristics we saw of the Christ as we've been walking and journeying, first of all, was the characteristic of humility we saw through the baptism of the Christ was an act of humility. And then we saw the other characteristic of the Christ was that of love. Everything Jesus did, he did in love. And that is what we, as the children of God, are supposed to do. And now this morning, as Christ is just about to go to the cross. Not not too many hours yet. Christ is going to be going to the cross. We also see now Christ teaching us something else through those three men, that not only are we to live our life of service for him in humility, we're to live our life and our service for him in love, but we're also to live our life and our service for him by watching, by staying awake. You see, our Lord says to us this morning, as he said to Simon Peter, what? Could you not watch one hour? The psalmist said that our time on this earth is a vapor. It's here, and as quickly as we come in birth, our life is gone. It's very short. Shall we say it's about an hour? Jesus said, can't you watch with me one hour? Folks, it won't be long and we'll leave this earth. Some of us sooner than others. The Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and we'll be with him. But while we're here, Christ said, I want you to watch. Can you just take that short period of time that you have on this earth and watch? Can't you spend that time and be spiritually awake? Can you spend that time watching and praying that you enter not into temptation? I I need you, Simon Peter. I need you, James. I need you, John. I need you here because I don't want to be by myself, but I also need you once I'm gone. 
because I need you to carry the work on that I have started. I need you to take that light, and I need you to take that light out, and I need you to do that work. Simon Peter, could you not pray with me one hour? Could you not just spend a little bit of time with me? Simon Peter, could you not prepare yourself? The devil wants to destroy you, Simon Peter. The devil wants to take your ministry. He doesn't want you to ever be effective, Simon Peter. Could you not spend just one hour with me? Simon, could you not spend one hour with me? Paul taught us in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we as well, we don't know when our Lord is going to return. We don't know the hour and the day and the moment. We can guess and we can assume and we believe that it's closed. We see a lot of things being put into place that the Bible tells us must happen, but we don't know. And Paul writes to the church, you have to be sober and watch and pray. Because we don't know when he's going to return. heard uh, this week as the world is preparing for the end of one year, the beginning of another year, and oftentimes what they will do is go back through the previous year, they will look at those who have passed away, the, the, the famous names of people who passed away the previous year, and one of those who passed away was Billy Graham. And they took a quote from Billy Graham in the national news and what Billy Graham said was this, I look forward to entering the presence of my Lord and I desire to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I've said so many times that should be the desire of all of God's children, for all of us. It should be that we enter into the gates of heaven before our Savior to hear him say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you know that's what Christ wants to say for us? He does not want to say to us, you didn't do your job. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Christ has given us everything he said, I'll go with you, and I've got all power, and I'll go with you because I want you to be successful. Why? Because he as well wants to be able to say to us when we enter his presence, <laughs> Emilio, well done now, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He doesn't want us to be done. And that night, he didn't want Simon Peter to be a failure either. He said, Simon, can't you watch an hour? He said, the devil wants you. The devil wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your ministry. He wants to destroy your work. Simon Peter, couldn't you just watch one hour so that you don't enter into that temptation? So you don't fall to the deception of the devil? Peter failed, though God never condemned him. You ever notice that? Never did. In fact, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ merely looked over to him. And I believe with every ounce of love on his face, he looked at Simon Peter. When Simon Peter looked at the love of Christ on his face and realized what he had done, realized the words of Christ, the Bible says he wept bitterly. Christ never condemned him. Christ never put him off to the side. He loved him, didn't he, afterwards? was Simon who said, I go a-fishing. I go back into my old life. Go back to my old thing. That's what I know. It's what I'm good at. It's what I'm going to do. It was Jesus Christ, right, who stood on the shore. Hello! Fellas! Have you caught any fish? <laughs> he knew they didn't catch anything. No, we haven't caught anything. Peter said, that's the Lord. <laughs> Off his fisherman's coat, into the water he went. And there Jesus was making breakfast for him. He'd already had fish. He already had everything ready. He was there with the coals. He was making breakfast for them as they came up on. And what was it? What was it Jesus said to Simon Peter? Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Look at this. 
Peter, he brought in all these fishes the Lord gave to him. Oh, wow. One dollar, two dollars, three. Wow, this is going to be a payday. And Jesus said, Simon Peter, do you love me? I never gave up on you, Simon Peter. Yet you denied me. You turned your back on me. Peter went out went there, went back into his old lodge. But God said, I still have a plan for you. You fell, you stumbled, the devil got you, no doubt about it. But he said, Simon Peter, I want you to still do the same thing I called you before. I want you to go feed my sheep. Last time I told you to go and I'm going to teach you how to catch fish. I'm not about to tell you that, Simon Peter, because you're back out in your old life and you're going to think I mean that you go out and catch more fish. So this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you to feed my sheep. If you really truly love me, do the work I've called for you to do. Simon Peter, don't fall asleep. Don't spiritually go to sleep. Simon Peter, get busy. And dear Christian, he's saying that to every single one of us who has a true heart of serving God. God, I want you, whatever it is that you want in my life, I want to do it. Wherever you have me to go, whatever you have for me to do, I want to go there and I want to do it. Watch. Be sober. Because the devil wants you. As a roaring lion, he's seeking to destroy you. And so as our Lord is preparing to go now to the cross, he says, watch and pray. Watch and pray so that you don't enter in to that temptation. Let's pray. Father, this morning I have done my best to try and present this passage of Scripture as you presented it to me and to my heart, my life. And uh, Father, I hope and pray that now it's been a blessing to your church. Uh, you inspired for us in your word that the church is to be a place of edification or to be building up of one another. And Father, everyone who has entered through the door of this building this morning, and many other buildings, but this building this morning, as we've heard this lesson, I believe that you have a work for each of us to do. You have a plan for each of us. And Lord, the word that you gave this morning is specific to us that you're telling us to watch and pray. Our work is still ahead of us. It's still great, and there's a lot that has to be done. And so I believe, Lord, that you've taught us humility, you've taught us love, and now you're telling us that we need to stay awake. We need to spiritually stay awake, Father, and pray. Else we'll enter into the temptation. Father, help us now this morning with these things that we've heard. May they sink down deep within our heart and our mind and our very soul. And Father, may you use these things that we've heard this morning that we may hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed this morning. We have what we call the old-fashioned altar. It's merely a time as Jacob at Bethel, Bethel in Hebrew meaning the house of God, he took 12 stones and he set them up. And he, uh, they had been a pillow for him, but he set them up and he made an altar out of them. When God had spoken with him that night, and there he prayed, and he, he, he said to God, God, as you have spoken to me, if you will do what you say, I'll do what you've asked for me to do. And he did business with God that night. So we call it the old-fashioned altar. It's merely a time, whether it's where you're sitting, whether you choose to come forward and kneel and pray, it's entirely up to you, between you and God, and you and God alone. But if God has spoken to your heart, if the Holy Spirit of God is tugging on your heartstrings right now, whatever that it may be that he's spoken to you about this morning, please do not just push it off to the side. You speak to your God this morning as he is speaking to you. The piano will play, and as it does, the old-fashioned altar is open.